Good afternoon to everybody. I'm presenting a study on uh, durability and effectiveness of isoniazid preventive therapy in Lesotho. Um, the problem of TB is uh, almost global, but the major TB hotspots are in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. And you'll notice that Lesotho is sitting right at the tip in, within South Africa, also struggling with uh, the problem of TB. Um, the country itself is also one of the sub-Saharan African countries that um, has, have, have got a big problem of uh, co-infection, TB and HIV. And uh, the use of IPT in Lesotho is slightly different from um, it is being used in South Africa in the sense that in 2011, um, the country started giving what we call universal IPT for all HIV positive patients. And bearing in mind that the country is a high HIV TB burden setting, we had some doubts whether it would work under the circumstances that the country faces. Um, just to show where Lesotho is, you'll note that it's one of the countries which um, uh, is facing the, the uh, double problem of TB and HIV. Um, the IPT course was approved in 2004. Um, however, there was a problem with uh, uptake of the uh, preventative therapy. You will notice that the rest of Africa especially, although South Africa has been doing quite well, but it also had some challenges between 2011 and 2013. Um, so it's, the uptake itself was a major challenge, let alone the problem of the effectiveness. Um, just a little bit of a background. Um, the use of IPT had several challenges before it was approved for routine, routine use globally. Um, the major challenge was to balance the problem of um, uh, the, the effectiveness itself. The more you use a longer treatment, for example, 36 months, the more you are likely to have toxicity issues coming in. And you'll notice that um, the major trials that were done were either 36 months or six months IPT course. And you'll note that the 36 months had a three year protection or the six months pro uh, course had a six months protection. And also um, there were other uh, drugs that were tried Rifampicin and parazinamide, but these were found to have uh, toxicity challenges. So how effective is universal IPT when it's given to every HIV positive patient in a high TB HIV burden setting uh, was an interesting case for us to investigate. Um, just a small background again on Lesotho's HIV TB situation. You'll note that it's uh, one of the worst affected countries in terms of uh, HIV and TB with prevalence rates ranging um, uh, quite in the, um, above 20%. And when you look at the TB, you then note that the country is, is a, has got a huge challenge. It's more than 700 um, cases per 100,000. This is also noted in other countries, such as South Africa and Swaziland. Um, high rates of co-infection, 74% of TB positive patients are co-infected with HIV, um, and there are other challenges. For example, the notification rates, there is still a lot of um, gaps in terms of uh, the kind of data that is generated within the country, where you've got um, the actual notification rates not um, getting close to the estimated prevalence rate in the country. And, um, Besides that, we're also facing a problem of uh, treatment itself. There are high rates of um, unsuccessful treatment, or what I would say, uh, failure to uh, get rid of the TB itself. And you'll note that this falls into two categories, mainly defaulting of TB and treatment failure. They remain as uh, the major causes of unsuccessful treatment. And we also have another problem, the use of gene expert, which would be um, good if it was being used um, 
as widely as possible. But you note that uh, we're still struggling to get to 20%. So this is a major challenge um, with the use of gene expert um, in public hospitals. Right, um, having introduced this small background, I can then look at what we did. The study was done um, in eight district hospitals uh, sampled to balance the distribution of the population. You will note that the country um, has got some regions that are sparsely populated and also densely populated. So the sampling had to reflect that. Um, collection of data, the HIV positive uh, subgroups that were included, um, they include children, adolescents, adults, and also pregnant women and the old uh, or geriatric uh, patients. And um, the analysis of the data was had to also look at the realities of the data that we could get from the public hospital. So we had to depend on what we would call discrete time survival data. By that, I mean, I wish I could be able to uh, move around some kind of an indicator, but if you check on the, um, on the diagram I have, you will note that, right, we were interested in the TB status uh, as the study progressed. You will note that um, the occurrence of TB, um, of course, here would be indicated by a one, and we also had um, the occurrence of TB signs. So in the patient like this, you would say the patient was given INH or IPT, um, at this point and finished uh, six months later. And you will note that the patient at some point had TB signs and later on after ANH developed TB, which is shown by a one here. So this was quite common um, in the data that we had. Um, in terms of sampling, we had to um, exclude patients who had uh, previous um, TB occurrence and also other um, exclusion criteria that we had to apply. We had uh, all in all 4,122 and after thinning out the data or data cleaning, we ended up with 2,955 who were included in the final analysis. The analysis was mainly based on uh, proportional hazard regression modeling, which was done in uh, the program starter. Um, before I look at uh, the TB occurrence, I just want to show that um, the use of the IPT um, prescriptions, they, it, has been, it had been prescribed 68.8% by the end of the study. Um, but then what we noted is all those, about 70% of the patients that received IPT, the initiation rate was quite sluggish or slow you will note that here um, we had 20.6 per 100 person years, um, which would mean only 20 patients or so would get IPT within a year if there were 100 patients that are being considered. So, uh, and we also noted that the slowest t uh, initiation of IPT was in the subgroups, uh, children and also in the districts that had, have higher population density and patients who had been uh, on ART for more than or equals to five years. So those groups um, had challenges in getting IPT. And the graph also um, showed us uh, what I would say is somehow a sluggish uptake, which is common in uh, also other African countries, I, I guess. Right, um, we also had quite other challenges which are important for me to report. Misdiagnosis of TB. Um, it was um, a major challenge, 27.6%. And also um, side effects. Um, we, the major side effect uh, was skin rash. Um, this has got significance in the sense that some patients, when they see their friends having this skin rash, would resist the use of IPT. And also peripheral neuropathy was also um, another major challenge. But you will note that there are very few patients who were stopped uh, from taking IPT because of these side effects. And when we looked at defaulting, we, not, we noted that there was a, um, 
a low rate of defaulting, 6.6%. Um, and this defaulting, when analyzed, uh, was associated with either being a male patient or staying in a sparsely populated district, or in some cases, um, uh, patients who also um, were, had uh, some other challenges. But these are the two uh, variables that came out as significant. Um, now, you will note that not all patients who got IPT um, did not get TB. So it became another important outcome. Um, and this is the picture that we got, the number of months after taking IPT uh, when TB occurred. You will note that we still had patients who developed TB um, while taking IPT, which shows that they should have not been given IPT, especially those who developed TB with, um, while taking IPT and those who developed TB one to six months after completing the treatment. And um, we ended up thinking maybe this could be um, an area where there's need for, for improvement, especially uh, in dealing with diagnosis of TB. When we looked at the effectiveness of the, the, effectiveness of the drug IPT, in terms of TB incidences per 100 person years, we noted that um, getting IPT before ART had um, a better outcome uh, in terms of uh, TB occurrence um, that was equal to 1.7. Definitely, when you look at the before and the after, you'll see that people who got IRT, IPT before ART were slightly better, but no IPT, that's 2.6. Um, and when we further analyzed the data, the data, we realized that when IPT is given within one year of ART commencement, it's, it performs much better uh, than when it's given later. So these, we then had to um, look at the effect um, of the drug itself. You note that this is my major slide, which I think has got all the message I wanted to convey. You note that when IPT is given within one year, there is um, a better outcome, but um, after some years, you start to see that they start picking up again, which means there are some challenges with that treatment in this setting. Um, we also looked at other factors that were, uh, other factors that were associated with uh, the development of TB, and these were um, district category and baseline, WHO clinical staging, gender, median viral load, and duration of IP of a pre pre ad, which is not uh, now much better because of uh, test and treat. Um, and when we analyze those factors, we realize that these were the major factors that are associated with uh, the, uh, that predicted the TB event. And um, one of those factors was, it became important time to IPT relative to ART commencement. By that, I mean um, it was important to give IPT as early as possible, soon after commencement of, of uh, ART. My second last uh, slide shows what we had to do to calculate uh, the hazards ratios uh, associated with those variables. And you will note that um, one of those variables was a continuous variable, which showed that use, um, increasing time to IPT by one six month interval increased the risk of contracting TB by between six and 59%, depending on the cohort. And just to conclude, um, the effectiveness of IPT depends on time to IPT relative uh, to ART commencement, which means as soon as a patient starts ART, they should start IPT. There were some other studies that also back up, as is shown on the slide. The high risk of reinfection is another major challenge in high TB burden settings such as Lesotho. Again, this was reported in other countries that are shown on the slide, South Africa, Ethiopia. Um, and the last point is that we probably would need booster doses um, wherever necessary, I mean, wherever possible to uh, keep the chances of TB development down. I thank you. Unfortunately, in sake of time, um, we have to move on to the next presentation. I'd like to remind the speakers to stick to 10 minutes presentation so we have room for questions. But maybe at the end of the session, there will be time uh, to speak about your presentation. So the next 
speak, I'd like to introduce is Katrine Zürcher um, from uh, Bern, uh, who did the work uh, she's going to present as part of her master thesis. So imagine what her PhD will be like. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and it's a pleasure for me to present here today in behalf of all my co-authors. Drug resistance and HIV co-infections are challenges for the global control of tuberculosis, TB, for patients with multi-drug resistance, MDR-TB, and extensively drug-resistance, XDR-TB, due to limited access for rapid drug-resistance testing and to appropriate treat TB treatment in many high TB burden countries. We aim to assess the impact of discordant anti-TB TB drug susceptibility testing performed locally versus the reference laboratories and to assess mortality in HIV positive and HIV negative patients in lower and middle income countries. The objectives for our studies were to compare drug susceptibility testing, DST, performed at ART programs or TB clinics versus phenotypic DST performed at the Swiss National Center for Myobacteria. Then we compared mortality during TB treatment by concordance or discordance of DST results by the degree of drug resistance and by TB treatment adequacy. We collected clinical data and myobacterium tuberculosis isolates from adult TB patients stratified by HIV and drug resistance status in seven high TB burden countries. The map below shows you the percentage of newly diagnosed rifrafampicin and MDR cases, and these stars represent the seven selected countries, namely Peru, Ivory Coast, Nigeria, the Congo, Kenya, South Africa, and Thailand. The HIV-positive patients were recruited from the International Epidemiology Database to evaluate AIDS, or IDEA, and the HIV-negative patients from TB clinics in the same catchment area. All the clinical data were collect collected electronically using REDCap. All sites screened their patients isolate using, using available methods such as liquid or solid culture, gene expert, or line probe assays, or a combination of these tests. As, and confirmatory testing was, as already mentioned, performed at the Swiss refer, reference laboratory using liquid culture mixes with the, with the following drugs listed below and with their critical drug concentrations. We collected a total of 871 isolates. However, we had to exclude 270, 237 isolates, mainly due to not growth or cont contamination for the first analysis or for the first outcome, the comparison of the DST results. And the further 61 patients had to be excluded for the mortality analysis, mainly because the patient was still ongoing treatment or the treatment on outcome was unknown at the time of data of the time of data closure. The median age of our patients was 33 years old, and a total um, the female and the and the percentage of females was 38. 42 percent of our patients were HIV positive, with a median CD4 count at start of TB treatment of. 192 cells per microliter. Comparing HIV negative patients to HIV positive patients, HIV positive patients were more likely to be females, were more likely to have both exopulmonary and pulmonary, pulmonary disease, and were more likely to have a negative smear microscopy result. This table shows you that almost 81% of the results from the reference laboratory compared to the local laboratories were concordant, and the remaining 19% were discordant. Among the discordant DST results, 4% were potentially leading to non-treatment, 
11% were potentially leading to a novel treatment, and the remaining 5% were other discordants. On the right-hand side, you, you can see some, of, some examples. If we include the treatment which the patient received, we found among the concordant results that almost 97% received an adequate treatment compared to 78% among the discordant DST results. Now we move on to the, to the analysis on mortality. Maybe mainly briefly, the figure always shows you the univariate result and the table below shows you the multivariate results adjusted for sex, age, sputum microscopy and HIV stages. The figure shows you that mortality was around 8% if the DST result was concordant and was ranged up to 40% if the DST result was discordant, potentially leading to an under-treatment. Similar was seen in the adjusted model, which showed that the odds of death was 9.5 if the DST result was discordant, potentially leading to an under-treatment. Not surprisingly is that patients with a pre-XDR or, or an XDR TB had the highest mortality compared to patients with a pan-susceptible TB. This was seen in the unadjusted as well as in the adjusted model. And the results for treatment adequacy, we separated the analysis by patients with a pan-susceptible TB and also treatment adequacy and inadequacy. Inadequacy includes patients which received an under or an over treatment. And the figure shows that patients with a pan-susceptible TB adequately treated had a mortality around, of around 6%, while the patients with any type of resistance inadequately treated had a mortality of, of 53%. Comparing patients with a pan-susceptible TB adequately treat, treatment treated, the, the adjusted odds of death was 4.2 if patient had, had um, any kind of resistance and received an adequate treatment and had an odds of death of 21.5 if they had any type of resistance and received an inadequate treatment. None of these results, which was highly significant also as you can see on the confidence intervals. HIV status, sputum microscopy, and sex was, none of, was, in, a, on, was in none of the adjusted models um, associated with mortality. Of course, our study also has limitation. First of, first of all, due to our sampling strategy, we are not able to estimate the prevalence or the incidence of drug resistance in HIV positive or HIV negative patients. Although we exceeded our planned sampling sample size, it was quietly reduced to, due to bacterial contamination or missing information. Also, we have to acknowledge that some of our discordants might be explained due to heteroresistance, mixed infections, or minority resistant populations. And of course, also, at the reference laboratory in Switzerland, we only tested common first and second line drugs and definitely have missed resistance to other drugs. In conclusion, our study showed that discordant DST results were associated with inadequate treatment and contributed to excess mortality associated with drug resistance. Our study supports the notion that access to detailed DST testing for first and second line drugs a treatment initiation is needed to improve treatment outcomes in patients with drug resistance. Understanding factors contributing to DST, discordant DST results is necessary to improve diagnostics and treatment outcomes. I would like to, I would briefly say that we just submitted the paper to the Lancet Infectious Disease and the preprinted version is available on the link be below. And finally, I would like to thank the IDEA, Matthias Ecker and his team in Bern, 
Sebastian Gagnon and his team in Basel, and Eric Böttger and his team in Zurich, and of course our founders, the NIH and the Swiss National Foundation. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Very nice. I'm sure there are questions. Maybe I can start. Um, can you say something about the time to adequate team, uh, treatment and the time to uh, doctors having the, the drug resistance results? Because obviously that matters in terms of analyzing mortality. Yeah, I mean, of the gene expert results, they got them very soon. But of course, if they had culture and they, they took them six or longer, and of course, the results from Zurich, they really received them very late or even we just, we just told them the results and also of the discordancies. So actually, they first got them very late, and that was, yeah. We also first informed them now what, yeah, what we found out, so, yeah. We cannot, uh, we cannot not on. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, first, did you, do you have any uh, evaluation of the risk factors for having uh, uh, incorrect uh, uh, resistance testing? And did you give feedback to, uh, to the original testing labs? And, and what was the interaction with those laboratories? Um, yeah, we will give feedback to all the countries. So they already received feedback from our, our side. And we also have, for all the data, we will have the genomes also very soon, or we have them actually available, so we also can test if we might have, there were some errors also at, in Zurich, so actually we can now prove on the genome level if the, where exactly there were some resistance patterns, so. And we will inform actually all sites, Zurich and the sites. I would also have a question. Um, so locally, the uh, drug test uh, susceptibility was, was done by culture, expert, and uh, uh, line probase. Which, which, which one uh, you saw, you found more discordant results as compared with the DST reference method? We saw qu quite a few in the culture, actually, for one drug, it was Embabutol, but we know that it's quite difficult to test, actually, and to assess, so there we actually are very looking forward to have the genome data to see wh what happened, really. And, of course, we also have to say that we found differences by the gene expert, but there it was more that we found in Zurich more resistance. Like, we found there also there were resistance against isoniazid, but actually the local they saw there was a resistance against rifampicin, and they straight away te um, started the patient on second line because they assumed they were um, MDR cases. So they, they did everything correctly. They followed the guidelines, and, or they national guidelines. So we, we say they did everything co clinically correct. And so there we also wrote in our paper that if they only had availability to, or only had gene expert as a diagnostic method and they did everything correct, we not saw them as discordant if we then found in Zurich they also had the resistance against isoniazid. However, if they had other tests before, performed and only saw one resistance, then we, saw, we say, said, okay, that was a discordant. So we really try also to differentiate what was available locally and what was not available. Okay. Are there any more questions? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question about the turnaround time. And when you look at the... Um, these discordant results, which was the cause of mortality, I think it's it was so. That's one thing. Second, uh, you mentioned gene experts, but I have not seen any results about gene experts. And then, when I looked at the map you used, you take, you, you take into account uh, samples from African countries, and those countries have a gene expert in place. So, did you manage to look at those data from gene experts to look at the concordant, discordant? 
and compare because most of the results you have are related as DST, phenotypic DST related, I would say. So if we can answer, clarify please. more on that, it would be great. Um, Thanks. Yes, but not actually not all the African countries before, performed only DST. So we have the data and we have them in the paper. We really stratified exactly what each country did. I just not show them because otherwise the table was quite lengthy and quite also complicated to explain. So I will try to reduce it on the most important things, but otherwise just check the paper, then you will find it. I was Thanks. going to say, we have to read it in the paper. So yeah. thank you very much once again. <laughs> the next speaker is um, Fiona Cresswell. She's a, a physician from the UK, um, doing a PhD at the IDI in Uganda under the London School, focusing on TB meningitis. Um, the floor is yours. So good afternoon. Um, it's wonderful to see you here today. Um, thank you for coming to listen about our work on improving TB meningitis diagnosis, which is one of the most deadly AIDS-defining illnesses. Now, in the wake of the HIV epidemic, TB meningitis is the second leading cause of adult and pediatric meningitis in many countries. We know from autopsy studies on the cause of death in HIV-positive adults that 43% are found to have TB at the time of death, and this is usually disseminated. And about a quarter of those have evidence of meningeal involvement, but this is often unrecognized at the time of death due to diagnostic challenges. So the burden of TBM is high. Um, TB meningitis affects young adults, often in their 20s and 30s, at the time when they're breadwinners for their young families. Um, it begins with a headache, neck stiffness, and it progresses then into confusion, seizures, stroke, um, coma, and ultimately death without treatment. And you can see from the bar chart that the outcomes are considerably worse in HIV co-infection, with up to 80% mortality in the most advanced stage of the disease. Um, so we, the best thing you can do for someone with TBM is to start treatment before the onset of coma. But to do that, we really need good diagnostics. And one of the big challenges in TB meningitis is how to make a fast and accurate diagnosis. Smear microscopy has an appalling sensitivity. Culture is only moderately sensitive and takes two to three weeks before we get a positive result and is not widely available in many resource-constrained settings. So the best thing we have at the moment is the gene expert. Um, this is a molecular cartridge-based test which looks for presence of and mutations in the RPOB gene. This was recommended in 2013 by the WHO as the first initial test for TB meningitis. But with a sensitivity of 70%, it still misses at least sort of one in three cases. But thankfully, the developers of Expert have re-engineered um, the assay. They've added two additional DNA targets and doubled the amount of sample that reaches a PCR reaction. So this new assay, which is called ULTRA, is now WHO recommended and it has an eight-fold lower limit of detection in, in, uh, in vitro. So you know, there's hope that this is going to be the longer way to game changer in TBM diagnostics. Now, our group in Uganda have been evaluating the diagnostic accuracy of ULTRA on the CSF of adults presenting with meningitis. And this has been done in two sites in Uganda, which is one of the world's top 20 high-burden TBHIV countries. So since February 2015, We've been assessing adults presenting with headache and neck stiffness at two hospitals. Um, and they've undergone lumbar puncture, which has had routine CSF analysis, cryptococcal um, antigen, and biofire meningitis PCR panel. Um, those patients who are cryptococcal antigen negative have then gone on to have the, the CSF TBM diagnostic panel. So in this, this, the CSF is centrifuge to concentrate any cells, and then the cells are then resuspended and run on three assays. So that's ultra, expert, and midget culture. Um, now, unfortunately, in TBM, there's no kind of gold standard against which to measure the performance of ultra um, because the existing tests are imperfect. Um, so we've used two um, reference standards. The first is a uniform clinical case definition. This is something which was a consensus definition by experts in, in 2010 for use in research. 
Um, and the second is a composite reference standard, which is any positive CSF TB test. So during the study period, we've now done lumbar punctures on 535 adults presenting with meningitis. Um, we've performed ultra in just under half, so that's 260, of which 216 have been negative um, and 212 were negative by all the tests by the composite standard, but four were positive by culture, one of whom was also positive by expert, so ultra missed four cases. Now 44 were positive by ultra, um, of which 27 were positive by expert and 19 were positive by culture. So let's first have a look at the, the study population and, and the TBM population, that's the 48 people who were positive by any of the tests. Um, so they were young with advanced HIV infection, um, despite over half of them being on antiretroviral therapy. Um, as you'd expect, the, the TBM confirmed people had a higher CSF white cell count, higher protein, and a lower glucose, although the changes were much more subtle than you'd expect to find in, in a population with a normal immune system. And the, the TBM population, just around half, were alive at the time of discharge. So let's look at how ULTRA performed. First of all, against the uniform case definition. So this assigns a number of points based on clinical history, clinical examination, CSF analysis, and imaging. So we used those with probable, so that's greater than 10 points, or definite, with people with microbiological confirmation as a reference standard. So there was 57 people in those groups, of which ULTRA picked up 44. Now, when we use the composite reference standards, that's any positive CSFTB test, there was 48 positive, of which 44 were positive by ULTRA. Um, but in some of these patients, it wasn't possible to collect a large volume of CSF. Um, so we couldn't done, run all three tests. Um, so we've excluded patients who didn't have all three tests from the Venn diagram and the two by two table. So there's 186 people in this group, of which 39 were positive by the composite, 35 positive by ULTRA. So ULTRA picked up additional 10 cases that were missed by all the other tests. So the numbers from those tables have gone into, into calculating the diagnostic accuracy. Um, so you can see that ULTRA has a sensitivity against a composite of 90% compared to 54% for expert and 49% for culture. So this is a huge sensitivity increase. And as a clinical researcher, I'm excited about the potential impact of this in reducing TBM mortality. Um, however, against the uniform case definition, ULTRA was slightly less sensitive at 77%, so it's possible that some probable cases are still being missed by all three tests. Um, but ULTRA did detect more than expert and culture, and that was statistically significant by McNema's test, with a p-value of less than 0 0.01. Um, now, what about specificity? Um, well, there, was 10, there were 10 cases positive only by ULTRA. Their details are shown there in the table. Um, and there's good evidence to suggest that these are true positives and not false positives. Um, the reason being that when we look at the limited detection, you know, ULTRA can detect as few as 2.5 CFUs per mil, whereas culture is 10 and expert is 100. So we'd, we would expect um, some patients to be positive only by ULTRA. And it does have a high uh, specificity in vitro. And indeed, most of these were in the trace category, suggesting they had an extremely low bacillary load. Um, next, um, ULTRA can detect non-culturable organisms, such as people who've been started on anti-TB therapy, or where there's been a strong inflammatory response that has damaged the bacilli and made them non-viable. So we, two of these were on um, TB meds. And the clinical phenotype in this group was highly suggestive of TB meningitis, with eight of the 10 passing away in hospital. Um, and lastly, you know, the, the specificity of ULTRA in pulmonary TB studies has been somewhat compromised by the fact that it can be, it's so sensitive it can detect, you know, bacilli or DNA from prior treated pulmonary TB, even years before. But in TB meningitis, we don't think that's going to be the case um, because CSF turns over very rapidly. It should be a sterile body fluid in the absence of disease. And also TBM in most people is a once in a lifetime disease. We don't think people are gonna be coming back with multiple episodes of this. So if you believe that these are true positives, like I do, then the specificity in this study population is 
If we reclassify those are false positives, it comes out as 94%. So in conclusion, ultra detects significantly more TB meningitis than expert or culture. Is it going to be the, the longer way to game change? Or will, I hope so, but we will only be able to tell that with prospective studies. And I will say that it's only likely to make its maximum impact as part of a um, you know, multifaceted package of measures to strengthen the system in which the test is used. And expert tests really must be used in conjunction with expert clinicians um, who must oversee you know, prompt lumbar function people with meningitis, collect a large volume of CSF, and also get results turned around and actioned quickly. Um, and empiric therapy does continue to have a place where the index of suspicion of TBM is still extremely high. So this is certainly not a rule out test. But I do think ultra is a, a big step in the right direction between, towards ending mortality from TB meningitis. So thank you for listening, and thank you to the, the team in Uganda and patients and families involved in this study. Thank you very much. Very nice. Um, one question maybe to start. How, does it, how do you think it has impacted uh, the clinical care? Uh, are you withholding treatment now in negative ultra patients? No, absolutely not. I mean, I, this certainly isn't a, isn't a rule out test. And although it is better than the existing test, you'll notice that against the, the clinical reference standard, the, sev the sensitivity is lower. So I think, you know, we still very much um, do believe in empiric therapy. Um, for these sort so of then the main implication that it's really nice for the expert clinicians to have a confirmed diagnosis and not wonder whether there might still be an alternative diagnosis. That no, absolutely. It's a, it is very helpful to, to know what you're treating, especially when people you know, need to be taking treatment for 9 to 12 months. Yeah. Um, and also in HIV positive people where there's a lot of toxicity and drug interactions, etc., it's really useful to know, to know where, where you're at. And, you know, um, I do think it, it has helped us to start treatment in, in patients where you wouldn't necessarily expect it. You know, we do have people coming in with a GCS of 15, very mild symptoms, and yet the ultra is positive in isolation. And in those patients, we perhaps wouldn't have had the impetus to start treatments. And so mm -hmm. I think in the early cases, it, it really could be, you know, those are the cases that will make a big difference. I presume similar to experts, the drug resistance is in the assay? Yes, indeed. So it, it detects rifampicin resistance. Yeah. Um, the performance on that in the pulmonary TB studies is, is about equal to expert. Yeah. Um, but. And one more technical question. Um, you mentioned that the samples are certif uh, certificated before, um, an, uh, uh, before putting them in the machine. Do you have yeah. any experience with uncertificated samples? Because obviously that would um, yeah. allow for easier implementation. Yeah, no, indeed. Um, we, we have done a study with experts on using spun versus unspun CSF, and there was a 12% increase in sensitivity. So in our, in our group, we found that, that it, it did help. I know in other settings, they haven't found it makes a big difference. Um, what I would say is that, you know, you're absolutely right. In, in sort of public hospitals, centrifuges aren't kind of universally available. Um, I think if you're getting you know, a reasonable volume of CSF, it does help to centrifuge it. But if you only have, you can't centrifuge it, and you only have one test to put your money in, then yeah. ultra is, is the one. And the sooner we don't need to be splitting samples across multiple things, probably we'll find that, you know, detection rates go up even further. Any other questions? I still have more questions, but... Actually, about the volume of uh, CSF, since it might play a role in the sensitivity, uh, and you have mentioned that not in uh, all patients you were able to, to get maybe more than 10 milliliters. So the, the, the volumes, when you compare uh, expert and uh, ultra, were, uh, the volumes were comparable? Yes, indeed, yes. Yeah. So the median volume collected was 12 mils which was then um, centrifuge and then split sort of three ways. So it's equivalent of sort of four mils really going into each test. So if you were to put all, you know, that into one test, you might find the sensitivity is higher. But um, indeed, we, we weren't able to collect that much in, in, in all patients because lumbar functions can be a complicated procedure. So, um, so we, we 
we, we, we prioritized getting a diagnosis for the patient, which meant the patient, the patients who only had small CSF samples, we put them all into ultra because we felt that was going to yield a diagnosis for them best, and then we excluded them from the analysis. We, we, we thank you. I, I, so, <laughs> we thank you. Uh, so I will uh, introduce the ne next speaker, Dr. Zhao. Uh, she is a medical resident uh, at the University of Cape Town, and she will register resident. Might be the same. And she will present clinical outcomes with bedaquiline use when substituted for second-line injectable agents in multidrug-resistant tuberculosis, a retrospective cohort study. Thank you very much for the introduction and good afternoon. Today I'm going to present our abstract titled Treatment Outcomes with Bedaquiline Use when Substituted for Second Line Injectables in Multidrug Tuberculosis, in Multidrug Resistant Tuberculosis, a retrospective cohort study. We have no conflicts of interest to declare. Second line injectables are core agents used in the treatment of MDR TB. Unfortunately, they're known to cause substantial toxicity, which often leads to treatment discontinuation. Stopping injectables without replacement by an effective drug weakens an already poor regimen and put patients at risk of worse outcomes. On the other hand, the novel anti-TB drug bedaquiline improved culture conversion rates when added to conventional MDR-TB treatment in clinical trials and observational studies. However, there are safety concerns associated with its effect on QT interval prolongation and the increased mortality associated with the bedaquiline arm in a phase two clinical trial. In view of this evidence, WHO made a conditional recommendation for bedaquiline use in patients with limited treatment options. And as a result, bedaquiline has been used as a substitute in MDR-TB regimen for patients unable to tolerate injectables. But the efficacy and safety of this strategy is unknown. We conducted a retrospective cohort study to evaluate treatment outcomes for South African patients in the Western Cape province substituting bedaquiline for injectables in conventional MDR-TB therapy and to compare the proportion of patients with unfavorable outcomes at 12 months with patients who did not discontinue injectables. In December 2012, bedaquiline became available in South Africa with limited indications. In September 2015, bedaquiline was rolled out to include MDR-TB patients unable to tolerate injectables. Local clinicians make requests to a provincial clinical advisory committee. And once approved, bedaquiline is provided for a minimum of 24 weeks. We screened all bedaquiline applications and included consecutive patients that received bedaquiline as a substitute for injectable between October 2014 and October 2016, before the introduction of the WHO short regimen in the Western Cape province. All patients received a standardized background regimen that did not include any other new, new um, or repurposed anti-TB drugs, such as linezolid or clofazamine. We also included a group of control patients with MDR-TB who did not receive bedaquiline, matched one-to-one -one for clinical location and time of treatment initiation within a six-month window. The primary outcome measure was the proportion of patients with unfavorable outcome at 12 months, defined as a composite of death, loss to follow-up, or failure to achieve sustained culture conversion. Sustained culture conversion was defined as two negative cultures with the last culture performed at 12 months with a window of two months on each side. We included 330 patients with MDR-TB detected on sputum in the analysis, 162 cases with bedaquiline um, substitution, and 168 controls. Patients younger than 18 years and those with pre-XDR or XDR-TB were excluded. 
Data on the primary endpoint was missing in 43 patients, mainly due to restricted access to the National Death Registry and missing follow-up culture results, which could be from an inability to produce sputum. The proportion of patients with missing outcome data was similar between the groups. The missing data did not sum up due to overlap in outcomes. Any failure event contributed to the composite outcome, even if another component was missing. Patients included in our study were treated in 51 facilities across the Western Cape province. For cases, baseline data were obtained from the Bedaculin application form. And for, contro and for controls, this information was extracted from the National Electronic TB Register. We obtained monthly sputum culture results from the National Laboratory Data Warehouse and dispensing information from the electronic prescribing system. The groups were well matched. 60% patient were male, and the overall prevalence of HIV co-infection was 70%. The only significant difference between the groups was CD4 cell count, which was lower amongst HIV-infected patients in the bedaculin group. 110 HIV-infected patients received bedaculin, with a large proportion of these patients on antiretroviral therapy prior to treatment initiation. 88% patients had positive sputum culture prior to treatment initiation, and there is no difference between the groups in the proportion of patients who were baseline culture negative. More than 80% patients switched from injectable to bedaculin. We observed a 44-day delay from discontinuing injectables and initiating bedaculin. Hearing loss was the most common reason for injectable withdrawal, present in 74% of those who switched, followed by renal impairment. Almost 20% patients had baseline contraindication to injectables and started bedaculin at a medium of 29 days. Reasons for not using injectable were similar. This is the capillary mail graph showing time to initial sputum culture conversion in each group during the first 12 months of TB therapy. On the x-axis is the time from start of MDR TB treatment, and on the y-axis is the proportion of patients with positive culture. Superimposed on the graph is a plot of the medium time to bedaculin initiation. 87% patients in the bedaculin group achieved sputum culture conversion by six months, compared with 79% in the control group. Unfavorable outcomes according to the primary composite measure of death, loss to follow-up, or failure to achieve sustained culture conversion was assessed in 287 patients. This outcome occurred in 36% patients in the control group versus 24% patients in the bedaculin group. And this translates into 34% medium reduction of unfavorable outcome with bedaculin use. These are the disaggregated components of the primary outcome. There is no difference between the groups in the proportion of death or loss to follow up. The reduction of unfavorable outcome with bedaculin use was mainly influenced by difference in sustained culture conversion rates. Only 6% patients in the bedaculin group failed to achieve sustained culture conversion by 12 months, compared with 17% in the control group. Co-infection with MDR-TB and HIV is common in sub-Saharan Africa, and there are drug-drug interactions with antiretroviral therapy that may influence treatment outcome in this with bedaculin use in this population. Our study included 110 HIV-infected patients on bedaculin, and we found no significant difference in 12 months unfavorable outcome between the groups, including mortality, compared with patients who were HIV uninfected. Culture reversion could be assessed in 241 patients, of which a total 13 patients reverted to culture positive at a medium of 263 days. 12 patients in the control group culture reverted versus one patient in the bedaculin group. 
To conclude, our study has shown that in this population with MDR-TB and a high burden of HIV co-infection, substituting bedaquiline for injectables resulted in improved outcome at 12 months compared with regimens containing an injectable for its full course. In this cohort, bedaquiline use was not associated with increased mortality, and outcomes were similar in a subgroup of patients of HIV-infected patients receiving bedaquiline. These findings provide support for the use of bedaquiline in MDR-TB regimen in programmatic settings. Since June 2018, South Africa is replacing injectable with bedaquiline for all MDR-TB patients from the start of treatment, including the short regimen, a decision that was partially influenced by our data. Finally, I'd like to thank my supervisors, Dr. Sean Wasserman and Professor Graham Menkes. I'd also like to acknowledge the support from the Western Cape province. And thank you very much for your attention. We also thank you for the very nice uh, data. And uh, I'm sure there are questions from the floor. If not, maybe I can start. Um, you have quite a high number of patients with hearing loss on the injectables. Is this um, from history or do you do hearing tests? It's from um, when my, uh, that's from the, um, for baseline data we obtained from the Daquiline de application form. It's when the um, clinicians identify the injectable toxicity based on hearing tests and then um, indicate that on the application form, and that's how we obtain the data from. And uh, can you say a little bit more about your injectables? Is there one you use, or is it multiple? Is it different? The injectable that was used in the um, conventional MDR TV treatment in South Africa is canamycin. Yes, please. Frank Oblens, Amsterdam Institute for Global Health and Development. Did you start both of your cohorts at the same time? Or was the, the control cohort started at treatment initiation? The question, the reason why I ask is that could it be before you started your bedaquiline cohort, could mortality, of course it depends on how much mortality there was, could mortality somehow have influenced your or differential mortality between the two groups? Could they have somehow influenced your uh, outcomes? And if you have you looked at that? You raised a very important limitation to our study, which is the possibility of immortal time bias, conferring an early advantage, survival advantage to the bedaquiline group. So for those of you not familiar with the concept, this refers to the initial period of observation time before bedaquiline substitution, when primary unfavorable outcome cannot occur in the bedaquiline group. And I just want to show you this slide. We, um, this is the kaplan mayer graph showing the time to death in each group during the first 12 months of TB therapy. And as you can see here, early mortality in the first two, three months was 5% and not significantly different between the groups. And this suggests limited survival bias towards the bedaquiline group. Any, any other questions? Yes, please. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you commented on the safety uh, profile for bedaquiline in, in terms of mortality, so there was no difference. But what about the QT prolongation? Do you have um, some data on that? Yes, um, due to the retrospective um, nature of our study, we were not able to obtain ECG recordings for all the patients. As you recall, these patients were treated in 51 facilities across the Western Cape province. So it was difficult to obtain all the ECG recordings with the limited resource of our study. However, in South Africa, the National Pharmacovigilance Program is in place. So before bedaquiline initiation, a baseline ECG has to be obtained. And a, QT, a corrected QTC of 400 um, of less than or equal to 450 millisecond is required for bedaquiline initiation. And monthly ECGs are obtained and read by a local clinician um, during bedaquiline treatment. Local clinicians either report 
um, any serious adverse event to a national pharmacovigilance program or to the National Electronic TB Register. So national pharmacovigilance is in place, um, and, um, but unfortunately due to the retrospective nature, we were not able to obtain that information. Um, on the other hand, the accumulating safety data has not indicated that the QT Polani effect of bedaquiline has been translated into any adverse clinical outcome. And there has yet been any, there has not yet been any reported deaths associated with cardiac arrhythmia associated with bedaquiline use. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Kelly Dooley. Uh, she is an associate professor of medicine at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. She also holds an appointment in pharmacology and molecular sciences. Her areas of clinical expertise include also infectious diseases. She will present the work safety and efficacy of dolutegravir-based art in TB HIV co-infected adults at week 48. Please. Thank you very much. And so on behalf of the entire study team, it's my pleasure to present to you today the 48-week results from the INSPIRING study, a clinical trial assessing the safety and efficacy of dolutegravir-based antiretroviral therapy among patients with TB and HIV co-infection. By way of introduction, dolutegravir is now recommended by the World Health Organization as a preferred first or second line treatment for HIV infection. And several countries with high HIV prevalence um, are rolling out dolutegravir increasingly, and we're more commonly seeing dolutegravir in settings where TB is highly endemic. The treatment options for patients with TB and HIV are relatively limited, largely owing to drug interactions with rifampin, which is an essential part of TB treatment. So we need better treatment options and more treatment options for HIV and TB co-infected patients. We know from one previous study in healthy individuals without HIV and without TB that giving dolutegravir twice daily at 50 milligrams together with rifampin give similar drug concentrations to giving dolutegravir 50 milligrams by itself. The inspiring study was designed to evaluate the safety and efficacy of dolutegravir-based um, HIV treatment in patients with TB HIV co-infection. And today we'll be showing the 48-week results. So this is the trial design. Um, this was a phase, three, ran, phase 3B randomized multi-center open-label, non-comparative, active-controlled parallel group studies. Individuals who were HIV treatment naive with newly diagnosed tuberculosis that was drug susceptible could be randomized. They were randomized three to two to dolutegravir, dosed at 50 milligrams twice a day during TB treatment and for two weeks subsequent to finishing TB treatment and then 50 milligrams per day after that. Those individuals randomized to efavirenz received standard dose of efavirenz at 600 milligrams daily. Patients were followed for 52 weeks and then were eligible to enroll in an open label extension to receive um, study medications beyond that period. Randomization was stratified by HIV viral load greater than or less than 100,000 copies as well as CD4 count less than or greater than 100 cells per millimeter squared. Cubed. The primary endpoint was the proportion of dolutegravir-treated participants with plasma HIV viral load less than 50 copies per milliliter at week 48 using the modified FDA snapshot algorithm in the attention to treat exposed population. The modified snapshot algorithm allows for one change of the NRTI backbone related to um, tolerability. Sorry, uh, we also looked at other outcomes, including virologic suppression in the efavirenz group, as well as change in CD4 count over time, safety, in particular focus on immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome or iris episodes, um, as well as emergence of resistance. 
So here you see the global enrollment. The total sample size was 113 individuals who were recruited from 37 sites in seven countries. You'll see that the majority of patients were enrolled in South Africa. The first patient in um, was randomized on January 23rd, 2015, and it took about two years to fully enroll this trial. Here are the baseline um, characteristics and demographics of the study population. On average, people were young with an average age of 33. A majority were men. And you'll see that over half the participants in each arm had a baseline viral load greater than 100,000 copies per mil. 20 to 30 percent had a CD4 count less than 100 at initiation of treatment. The average time from starting TB treatment to initiation of antiretrovirals was about 30 days, and the most common NRTI backbone included tenofovir, TDF tenofovir. Here are the modified FDA snapshot outcomes at week 48, and I'll draw your attention to the dolutegravir arm, where 75% of participants met the FDA snapshot outcome of virologic success at 48 weeks. You'll note that um, 17 participants were um, virologic non-responders. This was largely due to non-treatment-related um, events. Um, for the most part, these were lost to follow-up. Of those 17, 13 had virologic suppression um, prior, uh, at some point during the study. There were no deaths in the arms. There were no changes in ART. And um, uh, yes, and there were no changes to ART. Um, there were no adverse events leading to treatment discontinuation. The patients in the efavirenz arm did very well as well, with 82% meeting FDA snapshot outcomes at week 48. So there were three participants in the trial that had confirmed virologic withdrawal criteria, and that was defined as having a viral load greater than 400 copies per mil any time after week 24 on the study. And that was confirmed with a retest two to four weeks after the initial test. Um, there, this part participant in the dolutegravir arm started with a viral load of 1.9 million copies, and by the time of the 24-week visit, had a viral load of 767 um, copies per mil, which on retest had not um, fallen below 400, so it was classified as a vir confirmed virologic withdrawal. There was no treatment emergent NRTI and NRTI or integrase resistance observed. A second participant in the dolutegravir arm who met confirmed virologic withdrawal criteria had several epi had, um, episodes of virologic suppression um, during their time on study, but then subsequently had a viral load of 2484 at the 36-week visit, which when rechecked was still above 400, so met the criteria. There was no NRTI treatment emergent resistance, and the integrase genotype failed to amplify. One individual in the efavirenz arm also had confirmed virologic withdrawal after initial um, virologic suppression, had a high viral load of 76,000 at the week 36 visit, and um, resistance testing showed emergence of NRTI and NNRTI resistance. So this is just to show you the virologic response over time. I'll draw your attention to the blue line, which is the dolutegravir arm. You can see that by four weeks of treatment, over 50% of participants had a suppressed viral load. Um, that's not surprising. If you look at the pharmacokinetic data in the table on the far right, you'll see that drug exposures when dolutegravir was given with rifampin and dosed at 50 milligrams twice a day were very similar to dolutegravir dosed at 50 milligrams a day following completion of TB treatments. The median change in CD4 count in both groups was approximately 200 over the course of the 48 weeks. TB treatment outcomes in both groups were excellent with treatment success of 88% in the dolutegravir arm and 91% in the efavirenz arm. So regarding safety, uh, I'll draw your attention first to drug-related SAEs. There was one in each group. These were TB-associated iris events. Neither were um, neither, neither necessitated treatment discontinuation. There were two adverse events leading to withdrawal. Both were in the efavirenz arm. 
One was related to efavirenz hypersensitivity, and the other was a grade four elevation in GGT. Um, at psychiatric adverse events were also assessed over the course of the study and were 7% in the dolutegravir arm and 14% in the efavirenz arm. Regarding um, iris events, there was an independent adjudication committee that was masked to treatment assignment that, that looked at all potential iris events. There were four um, TB-associated iris events in the dolutegravir arm and four in the efavirenz arm. None of these resulted in treatment discontinuation. There were two non-TB-associated iris events in the dolutegravir arm, one strongyloidiasis and one herpes zoster. Again, neither of these uh, resulted or necessitated treatment discontinuation. Similarly, there, were one, there was one patient in each arm that had a grade three um, liver chemistry elevation, particularly ALT, between five and 10 times the upper limit of normal, and neither of these met stopping criteria for drug-induced liver injury. So in conclusion, dolutegravir 50 milligrams twice a day given concomitantly with rifampin-based TB therapy, demonstrated high efficacy and good immunologic response through week eight. 75% of participants met the FDA snapshot um, definition for treatment response at week 48. Among those who were non-responders, largely that was for non-treatment related reasons. Um, for the most part, these were lost to follow-up events that happened really over the full course of the 48 weeks without any um, specific pattern. Um, Dolutegravir concentrations were um, at or above targets in the patients in the study. Uh, Dolutegravir also was very well tolerated. The majority of the adverse events were grade one and grade two. There were no iris events or liver toxicity events leading to drug discontinuation. And TB treatment success in both groups was high at about 90%. So this study provides evidence. Uh, we think that dolutegravir is effective and well tolerated in patients with HIV and TB co-infection and that this treatment could be offered to that subgroup of participants um, and will represent an important treatment option um, for this particular group. We're really grateful to all of the patients who participated in the study, as well as the extended study team. Some of the investigators are listed here, um, and thank you for your attention. We also thank you, and uh, we are waiting for questions from the floor. If not, I, 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 would, uh, I would like to, to say something about the low percentage of iris. I was surprised to see very low percentage of iris, and I'm wondering if it, it, it was not due to the fact that the uh, duration of TB treatment was, uh, I don't know, less than eight weeks, right? No, yeah. Um that's, that's a good question. So yeah, all of the patients received a full six months and some nine months of TB treatment, depending on what the guidelines were for HIV-associated TB treatment in the country in which the participants were on study. Um, people started their TB treatment and, for, and received that for two to eight weeks before starting their HIV treatment. So co-treatment was for several months. I will point out that the average CD4 count in this study was 200. 200. And so I would suspect that, um, you know, that iris events are much more common in patients with lower CD4 counts. And so I think, you know, further work is needed to look at patients that yeah. have CD4 counts below 50. They were excluded from this particular trial. I also would like to point out that it'd be, it'd be nice to um, explore this combination in children. Yeah, this is like what, what I was saying, that uh, actually they were allowed to get anti-TB treatment uh, many weeks. Okay, so thank you. A any other questions? Yeah, and that meets WHO guidelines for initiation of yes. HIV cool. treatment between two and eight weeks after starting um, TB therapy. Okay. Um, any other questions? Uh, yes, Thank please. you for the, the presentation. Uh, WHO is also coming with uh, new guidelines to, for TB preventive therapy, which recommend use of rifapentine and isoniazide over a shorter period. Has there been any exploration on its use? 
particularly in this uh, in this uh, population? Yeah, so good question. So, um, so yes, there's currently a trial um, that's being conducted in South Africa looking at 3-HP, which is once weekly dosing of isoniazid and rifapentine um, in patients who are receiving dolutegravir-based HIV treatment. And so that's um, looking at the safety um, of that combination and then also what the right dosing of dolutegravir will be in that setting, whether or not a 50 milligram dose will be sufficient or knowing that rifapentine is a strong inducer if a night dose of dolutegravir is also going to be needed. So thank you for the question. Those data should be coming soon. Yes, please, one last question, please. Yes, so uh, um, several of your patients who were virologic failures for uh, dolutegravir um, were initially um, uh, had low viral loads and then back, bounced back up. Did you uh, assess the adherence, retrospectively look at the adherence in those patients? Yeah, so I think the, the, majority, so the majority of people who were snapshot non-responders um, initially had virologic suppression, and then those patients were subsequently lost to follow-up for any number of reasons. So we tried to look to see if there was any pattern to that. Like, was it um, in the early part of co-treatment when people maybe had side effects to twice daily um, dolutegravir dosing? And, and that largely the, um, the discontinuations happen following the completion of TB therapy. And they happen any time between 30 days and you know, 200 and 300 days after randomization. So there didn't seem to be a pattern. Not expecting to hear much about side effects with dolutegravir. Were there, were there side effects with uh, twice daily? With the um, there, were, there were some side effects, which I can show you here. Um, this was, these were adverse events happening in more than 10% of, um, of people in either group. And this, co this comprises both during um, co-treatment and then, um, and then following um, uh, completion of the TB therapy. Yeah. Thank you. And before closing the session, I uh, would uh, like to remind you that if there are people interested in um, asking questions about the first presentation, the durability of uh, isoniazid preventive therapy, the, the author is here. Um, thank you for the presentation. I just wanted to find out particularly on the the population of uh, patients that were taking IPT, that were diagnosed as having TB, did you do any DST on those patients to find out whether they had developed uh, mono resistance to the IPT? Um, oh, please, yes, please. Right. Um, the for the patients who developed TB while taking IPT, we did not have um, DSTV res DST results for that um, for that cohort, but we have noted the need for checking for drug resistance. And uh, if in one of the slides you would have noted that I pointed out for the need the need for checking for drug resistance uh, in in that co patient cohort. Okay, we, we thank you very much, and I would like to thank the co-chair, the, all the presenters for the excellent presentations, and thank you for attending this session. Uh, we, we end the session with a small delay. Thank you. Thank you.